Welcome everyone to this first session of the room in the room three of the uh, technical the first technical session in the ATM seminar meeting. I allow me not to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or whatever because uh, we have people all around the world. So it's better to say good day to everyone. Uh, this is the first technical session in the meeting. There are just two papers. Let me share with you my screen. Okay. And you have here the two sessions that you will enjoy this evening. The first one is Network and Strategic Flow Optimization. Your session chair is myself, uh, Jose Miguel de Pablo. I'm part of the executive committee of the ATM seminar, and this is my pleasure to be the, the chair of this session with two panelists. In one side, Marta Sanchez, and in the other side, Christopher Chin. Both of them will be delivering the, the presentations for this session. There will be 30 minutes presentation for everyone. And after the first 30 minutes, 10 minutes question, and after the second, exactly the same, 10 minutes questions. Please use the questions and answer, the question and answer button on your Zoom page in order to present your questions and uh, feel free to start to uh, send uh, your questions as soon as possible. The, this first session is starting right now. I have already eaten two minutes of the presentation. Let me go directly for the meet. And the first presentation is uh, in this network and strategic flow optimization is called probabilistic complexity in support of higher space capacity management optimization. And the presenter is Marta Sanchez Fidoncha. She works for CRIDA as myself. Uh, CRIDA is the Spanish reference center for R&D in aviation. Uh, she's, uh, she holds um, a master in industrial engineering, specializing in innovation life cycle, and has more than 50 year experience, even if it is not clear when you see she. Uh, currently, she's manager and technical developer of R&D projects in the field of air traffic flow and capacity management, and also in CSR US space projects. Marta, this is uh, your time. Thank you, Jose Miguel, for the for the nice introduction. And uh, you you sent me already some time presenting Crida. And um, I hope uh, you can see my screen now. It's okay. In presentation yes, it's mode? okay. It's okay. 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 Perfect. Uh, so as you say, good day to to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. And um, I'm going to present a paper, which is a collaborative uh, work uh, between myself that I've been introducing already by, by Jose Miguel, the session chair, and two co-authors uh, uh, whose name are Eva Puntero and Dalin Zeng, also working on CRIDA by the time the, the paper was written and the work was uh, developed. And uh, what I'm going to present uh, is the, the result of a work of integrating uh, a complexity predictor of the of the traffic, which is probabilistic complexity, um, a metric that uh, we have developed in the house in Crida, already introduced by by the chair of the session as well, uh, in support of uh, an air traffic management process, which is uh, air space capacity management optimization. So, I will start uh, already with the with the presentation. So we can better share the, the view of uh, the scope of the, of the work I'm going to present and uh, the different concepts and, and tests that we have developed. Um, so uh, the, uh, the scheme of the presentation is uh, as is shown in this slide. Uh, first of all, I will introduce uh, the concept of uh, dynamic airspace configuration as it, use, uh, it is used in, in air traffic management. Uh, in particular in the air traffic uh, capacity and, and flow management uh, process and the expected benefits and what's the problem statement, what are the, the challenges and why are, are we have uh, developed this work to, to solve them. 
then uh, I will enter into more technical details on the type of uh, complexity predictor metric, uh, which we, we call the probabilistic uh, cognitive complexity, and uh, how, uh, thanks to the introduction of this metric and other uh, different uh, enhancement, uh, we can obtain a better capacity management. And finally, I will present uh, the, the optimization that uh, we have done of the response capacity management process and some test results uh, that, uh, as uh, you can see on the disclaimer, uh, have been done, uh, and this is uh, something that we have mentioned, we have to mention, have been done in the framework of um, exploratory research uh, project funded by the European uh, CSR joint undertaking, uh, which was called uh, COTON. And uh, that was uh, funded, uh, as I say, as part of this exploratory research program. The work I'm going to present is the contribution uh, that was made by CRIDA to this project and also enlarged by other internal uh, uh, developments and, and research uh, that we have done in the house. So first of all, uh, the, the statement of the, of the problem and uh, the description of uh, what uh, is the dynamic space configuration uh, uh, process or, or concept in, in ATM. Uh, the dynamic uh, space configuration, or, or uh, DAC in the, in the acronym in, in English, uh, is um, a process or a concept that pursues higher levels of flexibility in the space design and the configuration process. So uh, currently uh, in the ATM, uh, in the major parts uh, of uh, uh, for, for the capacity management or the ATFCN uh, process, we have uh, uh, the configuration of the airspace along sectors. And uh, uh, this is, uh, these are traditional predefined airspace structures that are commonly used. What introduced uh, the DAC concept is uh, increasing the capability of the airspace to adapt to the traffic demand, uh, both uh, in nominal situation and in cases uh, of uh, unexpected uh, events uh, occurrence. And uh, that means uh, that instead of using these uh, traditional predefined express structures, uh, we can opt to uh, implement or deploy dynamic configurations uh, of their traffic control sectors and adapt them to the uh, traffic evolution uh, that we have. Uh, this is a process that takes place, uh, take place uh, some time in advance uh, to the day of operations. And um, that means uh, that um, the, the opening schemes and even the, um, the uh, deployment of the final sectors uh, to be executed in the day of operations are optimized to uh, account for the available capacity and uh, to better balance uh, the ATC workload. So, um, the expected benefits of this uh, new concept, uh, well, um, uh, an optimized uh, DAC airspace configuration uh, can 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 give us a number of uh, benefits uh, if we follow uh, the current uh, the correct steps uh, to to have a, a deployment uh, that is better tailored to the demand and the capacity. Uh, in the slide, uh, you can see uh, a number of uh, dynamic space configuration use cases, uh, which are part of uh, the, the process that is uh, at, at this current state of, of definition, uh, where we can start by identif identifying certain uh, uh, scenarios of demand uh, with a good forecast of the, of the demand. Uh, and then with a definition and design of uh, an optimum number of sectors based on certain uh, functional airspace block, which will be, uh, in the case of that, the basic airspace structures that will be used for the, for the final uh, airspace configuration. Uh, in the slide, you see the, the rest of the use cases that are proposed 
up to identifying uh, hotspots, uh, meaning uh, imbalances between the expected demand and the air traffic uh, capacity. Uh, but what is more interesting uh, of this slide is not to, to go through all these uh, use cases, um, but to uh, discuss on the on the traditional uh, way that the capacity is handled uh, with the traditional sectors. Uh, the capacity in traditional sectors is established in terms of uh, what is called entry counts. So the number of uh, aircraft entries in a sector per time unit. And uh, the maximum value is uh, dependent on the operational knowledge uh, about the sector of uh, relevant air traffic controllers that are used to operate uh, and that are certified to operate in that sector. Um, that means that we only can handle predefined structure as the, the process is nowadays uh, deployed. So one of the challenges uh, that uh, is, the, or, or the main challenge that the DAC uh, is facing to be, to be Currently deployed is the uh, uncertainty of the of the um, of the uh, traffic demand and uh, what it implies in terms of airspace capacity, which is relying a lot currently on human experience. Uh, so uh, there is a, a high risk uh, of this approach of uh, capacity planning instability if the demand uncertainty is not properly taken into account. Uh, during the sector the design and the configuration process. So that's uh, what it leads us to uh, the solution that we have tested in the in the work I I'm, I'm presented, uh, which is uh, the, the introduction of um, what we call the probabilistic cognitive complexity in the picture. So in the next slides, I'm going to present uh, what is this uh, concept of probabilistic cognitive complexity and how it can help to enhance this capacity management process and to implement uh, a concept like the dynamic space configuration that uh, is uh, potentially bringing a lot of benefits uh, to the to, to perform a better uh, demand and capacity balances, uh, balancing and um, with, uh, with uh, the best exploitation of the available capacity and uh, the best accommodation of the demand. The, um, the probability this complete cognitive complexity is, uh, is, a, is a metric uh, that belongs to a set of metrics uh, that are um, uh, created to uh, express what is called the air traffic complexity. And for those that are not acquainted with this, uh, the air traffic complexity is a measure of uh, that try to mirror the implicit difficulty for an air traffic controller uh, in managing certain set of traffic and the uh, area of responsibility, in this case, uh, an expert sector. So why this metric is put in the picture? Because uh, there is a consensus view uh, in the ATC re research uh, related to this um, uh, difficulty of managing traffic that uh, the, the complexity of the traffic uh, drives uh, the controller workload. And the controller workload is in the end what is limiting the, the capacity of, the, uh, of a given airspace. So uh, what we introduce here is uh, um, a complexity metric, uh, which biggest asset is that it considers uh, certain complexity factors that are intrinsic to the to the traffic uh, in a given sector and also to the to the shape of the analyzed sector and uh, that are uh, reflecting uh, or, or trying aiming at reflecting uh, the ATCO, the air traffic control and mental abstractions uh, that are done when managing a certain amount of, uh, of traffic. Um, the probability quantity complexity uh, is accounting uh, for, for a number of uh, 
what we call complexity generators in the in dynamic airspace configuration. So there are certain factors that are uh, impacting uh, the, the complexity of a given traffic and uh, that are taken into account into the, the computation of these metrics. And what is interesting uh, is that uh, this metric uh, is, is able to provide probabilistic results uh, that means that the, the results uh, of uh, prediction in complexity and are not deterministic, but a, a range of possible values with a probability associated, which is highly interesting when uh, we are using this kind of metrics in, um, in an uncertain process of uh, uh, predicting also the, the demand and uh, the, the capacity and the balance among them. So the factors uh, that are considered in the in the formulation of the probabilities cognitive complexity and, and I'm going to go in detail with uh, within the formula specific uh, um, within the um, within the, the metric but uh, just some some highlights um, uh, regarding the, the two main parts of the cognitive complexity. On the left hand side, you can see uh, the part that is accounting for the traffic expected in an area of airspace uh, at a given time. In the right hand side, uh, you can see uh, the factors that are accounting for uh, the shape of the uh, sectors or, or the configuration that that space uh, uh, is going to have. And this is an innovation by itself because usually um, many uh, complexity metrics are focused I focus on the traffic um, rather than on the on the shape of the of the sectors and uh, so what we have here uh, is the, a part that is accounting for uh, the, the uh, interactions uh, between traffic flows. Uh, and here um, there are a number of flights in one and in, uh, in the other flows and a factor that is accounting for uh, how those flows are interacting uh, between them. Uh, so it is different the weight in in, in case uh, the two flows are cruise flows or uh, the flows are crossing claim, climb descent uh, moments. Uh, so those kind of things are included in these flows interaction. There is a, another part of the complexity metric accounting for the potential conflicts. Um, and for each uh, potential conflict, uh, it was also taken into account if uh, it occurs uh, with a difference in the flight level of both flights uh, in time over the crossing point, those kind of things. The number of flights in evolution, uh, increasing the number of flights on evolution increase the complexity, for instance. The number of flights that are uh, out of standard flows, all those factors uh, are considered to, um, to measure the, the expected complexity of, um, of a traffic. And in the other side uh, of the slide, you have also uh, that accounting for the sector shape uh, of the sector where um, uh, more uh, irregular shapes are uh, usually more difficult to handle. And uh, that will be the, the summary of this but uh, you have the details on the paper, of course, but, um, and that, that will imply uh, more complexity for the, for the traffic controllers. One thing about the cognitive complexity part uh, accounting for the, for the traffic is that internally in CRIDA, we have developed already a normalization uh, of the values obtained to allow comparison to uh, a, a reference, uh, which is the, the ISA. ISA, Instance Daniel Self-Assessment, a scale that you usually use in, in for, by air traffic controllers, uh, for instance, in real-time simulations and uncertain tests to account for the level of difficulty of managing a certain traffic. So um, going to uh, another part, which is uh, highly relevant uh, for, the, for the work uh, being performed, um, I'm going to talk to you about the uncertainty 
inclusion in the complexity prediction. So uh, as you have seen, uh, the complexity is predicted by based mainly on uh, the expected uh, trajectories uh, of the flights that are going to cross a certain part of the airspace at a given time. Um, so those trajectories will imply certain uh, certain flexibility uh, and certain uncertainty uh, on the real execution that are going to be expected on the day of operation. The sources of those uh, uncertainties uh, will be related to uh, differences in the take of time, uh, to, to certain uh, control actions, uh, to differences in the, in the exact room flow. So is difficult to predict exactly when a flight is going to be at a point at a given time. And given that the calculation of complexity is based on uh, certain interactions into tra uh, between trajectories, it is important to input certain, uh, this uncertainty or certain factors of uncertainty into the picture to improve the robustness of the uh, complexity prediction. That means uh, that uh, for the for the work I'm presenting, uh, the uncertainty was introduced into the estimated time over of uh, the points along the trajectory for all the flights, following two assumptions that are uh, there represented. One was the variability of the actual time over with respect to the estimated one uh, for a flight at any point within uh, the sector or the space of interest. Uh, will be equal to that variability at the entry point to their space. So that's one of the assumptions we, we made for this first attempt uh, to include the, the uncertainty. And uh, the other assumption was to treat uh, or to, to manage the same level of uncertainty for all flights uh, belonging to the same uh, 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 traffic flow. That will simplify a lot uh, the calculations because uh, as I'm going to, to present in the, in the next slide, we have followed um, a, a detailed uh, historical data analysis to derive the uncertainty uh, that we input into the system to all the flights considered. So that means that, uh, as you see in the in the curves in, in the left hand side of the slide, uh, we have studied uh, for this uh, airspace uh, that was the the, uh, the target of the of the test. We have studied uh, a number of traffic flows, and for those traffic flows, we have uh, compute over the the historical traffic data the uh, estimation of the variability in the times over the points in the trajectory. And uh, that simplifies alone because uh, if we have to do the same at a flight level, uh, it will request uh, much more um, uh, computation time and, and the benefits of doing so are not clear because we are focusing on interaction between flows and from the results we are obtaining that seems to to be a, a good predictor of the level of complexity that we are going to have so what we have done um, for this uh, calculation of the uncertainties as i say to input uh, the the level of variability in these estimated times for the different flows and then uh, to uh, calculate uh, the results in terms of cognitive complexity following the, the formula that uh, I showed before uh, by uh, repeating uh, via Monte Carlo simulations the calculation a number of runs. Uh, where uh, the, the n number of runs uh, has been uh, calculated uh, to achieve results with uh, statistical uh, validity for the for the for the test so the random uh, deviation in the estimation time over is different in each of the end runs and after we have completed uh, the calculation of all the parameters a number of times then we obtain uh, n values of uh, cognitive complexity for a given time uh, of the period of operation. And um, from there, we calculate probability distributions of the cognitive complexity, and we can obtain 
cumulative probability of this uh, cognitive complexity above or below certain value, which is the, the percentile. So um, once we have that, uh, that will account uh, for the probability cognitive complexity calculated, calculator in this slide, uh, we can go to, um, to target the enhanced capacity management process. So if we are able to uh, calculate or predict a probability distribution of the complexity of a given uh, traffic situation, for, for the target airspace and time, then uh, we can input uh, the capacity management process and the dynamic dynamic airspace configuration with the, those predictions of probability cognitive complexity and uh, plan for a optimization of the possible configurations that uh, we, we have uh, predefined. So the configurations will be the different type of structures that we can have for the airspace, meaning that uh, we split the airspace in a number of sectors uh, with different shapes. And uh, since we are doing a probabilistic uh, estimation of that uh, uh, demand and the associated complexity, we'll be able to predict better the impact on uh, the aircraft controller workload and then to optimize uh, the number of sectors that we are going to open in a given uh, configuration and also to minimize uh, the occurrence of imbalances in demand and capacity. In the enhanced capacity management process that we have test in this uh, work, uh, we have performed also a ranking of configuration uh, based on human decision making. So uh, not just relying on the configuration optimizing, uh, optimizing results, but also involvement involving expert judgment with uh, some operational background into the into the uh, into the iteration. And finally, uh, the optimal configuration uh, is obtained. And uh, in the case of the exercise I'm going to show, a fast time simulation was the mean of checking if this optimal configuration was indeed uh, providing better performance results than the configuration that could be obtained uh, from a, a traditional sectorization. So um, the Configuration optimizer function uh, was um, uh, was built to try to reach uh, a number of objectives that are presented here, and um, we try to um, minimize uh, the the. Uh, value of the cognitive complexity in general uh, and the sector shape complexity as well, the two parts of the probabilistic cognitive complexity. And also we try to minimize or we target it to minimize uh, the number of sectors and uh, other uh, aspects of the solution. One thing where we focus was uh, the, the better balance between the, the complexity of the different sectors resulting in the configuration and uh, both in terms of cognitive complexity and sector shape. But in any case, uh, as I would show or I will discuss at the end of the, the presentation, the idea where, um, uh, that we took for building this uh, optimizer was that it was uh, uh, able, uh, it was to, uh, able to be customized by the operational final user so that each user can uh, better choose the objective function on the targets uh, that were uh, that, that were better fitting the, the operational uh, strategy of the of the user uh, one more thing before we we go into the test results is that uh, we consider uh, three type of uh, different thresholds in terms of complexity. If you remember, I presented before that uh, we normalize with the uh, ISA scale. Uh, that is one to five. Uh, one is uh, the less complex uh, 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 picture for the air traffic controller five will be the maximum and uh, we set a certain threshold as not acceptable in terms of uh, 
peak complexity. So that means that at any moment during the period of uh, a study, uh, there is certain complexity that cannot be reached. Uh, what we call a sustained uh, complexity threshold. That means uh, that uh, there is a, a high level of complexity, but can be handled during a limited period of time. And uh, the other uh, metric that we set was uh, the maximum period of time over which it is acceptable uh, to, to, uh, to work with this uh, sustained complexity threshold. One okay, minute, Marta. So, okay. So I'm, I'm going to the, to the results uh, already. Uh, to show you a, a quick glance of uh, what we have uh, obtained. First of all, uh, in this slide, uh, I just show you what uh, we use as reference scenario and we use a solution scenario. In the reference scenario, uh, we have um, uh, the cognitive complexity metric uh, chosen for the selection of uh, the sectorization in the dynamic airspace configuration. Uh, but here we are not considering any uh, uncertainty in the distribution of the traffic uh, as an input, and uh, we are not considering also the uh, sector shape as a part of the probabilistic cognitive complexity. So we are departing already from a situation where we have a complexity metric in support of the uh, dynamic airspace configuration, because otherwise we cannot account for the uh, estimation of capacity of the sectors. In the uh, solution scenario, uh, as you can see, uh, the tool uh, is completed with the incorporation of time uncertainty, as I explained before, uh, using distribution to the input demand based on historical data and uh, incorporated the Monte Carlo simulations. So if we are, since uh, we are closing, close to the, to the time limit, I will jump already into some, uh, the highlights of some results. So we, we tested a number of, um, of outcomes. Uh, in this case, I'm showing you some results on space capacity improvement. So the, the highlights are that we obtained in general with the introduction of the uncertainty, the, the probabilistic quantity complexity and the sector shape, better detection rates for overloads. And uh, that means that uh, the, the outcomes of the configuration uh, process is better adapted to demand. And uh, then uh, that means that the, the number of overloads is reduced. But even the remaining uh, hotspots are better mitigated. So the severity of those hotspots uh, is uh, reduced by comparing with the reference scenario. Uh, here in the table, you can see uh, the two types of solution scenarios that we use for uh, analyzing the space capacity improvement. Uh, so when uh, you see that there is a percentile 90% for probabilistic cognitive complexity, that means that uh, only uh, when the, the probability of the cognitive complexity being over 90% uh, is considered for uh, the, as, as a good predictor of the situation uh, in terms of uh, the complexity that is expected. And in the, in the figure that you have here, you can see uh, the, the threshold, um, the, the peak threshold for, for complexity uh, that we, um, we established and uh, the color columns or the, in the figure, the, the background, uh, which is color, is showing the, the hotspots. Uh, on one side, you have uh, an actual hotspot, uh, which is uh, the blue line. And uh, on, the, on the yellow line, you have the, the percentile 90% of the probabilistic complexity and the capability of predicting this hotspot. I see you much you less than a minute, much less than a minute. Okay. You are, you are over time now. Please go finishing. Okay. So 
just uh, uh, two other highlights. Uh, the cost efficiency uh, results, uh, what we obtained was the, thanks to the optimizer, we have reduced number of sectors uh, and also reduced number of aircraft per sector and uh, also more balanced workload among the sector, as you can see in the, in the figure that is the, uh, right on the bottom, uh, which was uh, one of the possible uh, target uh, in the optimization functions. But uh, final remarks, uh, I, I've included here uh, some other address performance areas, validation results, like the technical operational feasibility, uh, which was uh, only uh, um, uh, which was only uh, showing uh, as a um, uh, as a uh, flown that uh, there was high computational effort of the solution that we we tested. It was a, a research uh, prototype. On the safety side, we have uh, also reduced number of conflicts in the resulting uh, traffic over the selected configuration. And one thing to, to be highlight is uh, the solution, uh, both stability, thanks to the probabilistic input into the optimizer and also the adaptability. So um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the solution is uh, created to be able to be customized by the final spec user. And the next research phases that we have in mind uh, will uh, ensure uh, that uh, the weighting parameters uh, that are in the sector configuration optimization uh, are, are better aligned to particular uh, strategies of the final users. Uh, visualization of potential benefits of the con configuration is not yet included since it was a research uh, prototype. And for us is, uh, is another uh, objective to continue working on the stability of the configuration selection a long time uh, to minimize uh, changes in in the configuration results of the optimizer in the dynamic airspace configuration process. And uh, that's all. So now, so now time for some questions. Thank you, Marta. Time for questions. Please, if you have questions, uh, you are able to put them on the questions and answers session. Uh, if not, while well, you are thinking a little bit in the Four or five minutes that Marta allow us for questions, less than the 10 ones that were initially established. I, I would like to break the floor with uh, one specific one. Lots of the things you have said are dealing with uncertainties, lots of uh, uh, uncertainty sources. Uh, and what you are doing is predicting the cognitive complexity as a way to improve the sectorization. Mm -hmm. Do you plan or have already made a number of uh, data captures to check if those uncertainties are introducing so much variability on the cognitive complexity that makes this uh, not fully useful? Um, to be sure I understand the question. So do you mean uh, comparing the results in cognitive complexity with and without variability of the inputs? No, I mean, no. If, if you have a prediction of the of the situation and you calculate the complexity, the cognitive complexity over mm -hmm. this prediction, when uh, if you later on uh, try to have those data from the real world to know yeah. what is the variability and to know if it is inside or outside your area of uh, uncertainty, because if it is out of the area of uncertainty, you have a problem because yeah. uh, the prediction is not good. Yeah, I, I must um, uh, warn that this is a, a work that has been done outside the work I'm presenting. So as an input for this work, uh, we, we used um, a cognitive complexity metric that was already tested in that sense. Uh, that means comparing uh, the prediction uh, capability, taking into account the, the uncertainty of the, of the domain input uh, with what happened in, in reality so uh, I guess that uh, you mean that and yes we are uh, able to predict in terms of the ISA scale well the the complexity of the of the traffic of executed really in the uh, in the day of operation of what uh, really happened uh, but 
what I was presenting here was the, based on fast time simulation of the resulting traffic uh, over the optimization tool, just to, to be able to better compare uh, the, the different uh, performance uh, results of the traffic. So we were comparing the simulation of the resulting traffic and express configuration with the simulation of the resulting traffic and express configuration with and without the optimizer. So, uh, just for every for the for the sake of the audience, uh, do you have below uh, at the bottom of your screen you have questions and answers? Please, uh, if you would like to put any question, use this. Uh, because now there is not not a lot of them. Yeah, just another question, uh, Marta. Mm -hmm. Just before is the last one, and we have one minute uh, to finish. Uh, okay. You intend to implement this and to check this on the real world. That's okay. I have understood you uh, the well uh, from your license slide. Uh, yes, the idea is to evolve uh, the prototype that we created and that we already tested into. Uh, prototype with uh, potential to be used uh, as automated tool, uh, automation tool in support of the air traffic flow and capacity management uh, process. By when you intend to check this prototype? Uh, I mean, that's work uh, already being done uh, in, in CESAR uh, program in, in Europe uh, in, the, in the wave three. Uh, so the dates uh, are close at least for for TRLs that are not uh, uh, high enough for, for the whole prototype to, to be functioning. But uh, for basic features, uh, I will say a couple of years, but I will have to check. Okay. Thank you very much, Marcia. It's uh, 16.30. It's time to close this first presentation. Thank you for, for, for the presentation and for the clarity. And I hope you have enjoyed all of, all of you the presentation. Then before we go to the next one, thank you, Marta, to stop to share this. Thank you. OK. Uh, the next presentation is called uh, Airport Ground Handling with Hierarchical Control Objectives. And the guy that will be presenting this is Christopher Chin. Christopher is a, a PhD candidate in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the MIT. Uh, advised by Professor Hamza Balakrishian, and Christopher completed his undergraduate at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and spent a year at NASA Ames before starting graduate school at MIT. So, uh, Christopher, uh, this is your time to present everything, but first let me ask uh, all the audience to put the questions uh, as soon as they have ready on the question and answer panel, because I believe the problem with the previous presentation is that uh, we are not familiar completely with the mechanism. Please try to use them. Thank you very much. Uh, it's your time, Chris. Okay, thank you, Jose. Okay. Well, hi everyone, thank you for attending uh, my talk today. Um, today I'll be talking about some recent work looking at augmenting the ground holding problem uh, with different control objectives. And this is a joint work with Max, Karthik and Hamsa while we were all at MIT. Um, here's a quick summary of what we'll go through today. Uh, first I'll motivate why and how we are interested in augmenting the airport ground holding problem. Then I'll talk about the high-level planner. Um, this will be used to incorporate more complex objectives. And this high-level planner interacts with the low-level controller, which I'll cover in detail. And then I'll show some results from one of the scenarios we ran um, and briefly go over future work. So starting with the background and motivation. Um, so at a high level, we can consider an airspace system whether in the US, Europe, or elsewhere, um, as consisting of two sides, the demand side and the capacity side. The demand side can consist of, for example, schedules that airlines want to run, and the capacity side can consist of, uh, for example, airport arrival rates. And there's some back and forth interaction between the demand side and capacity side, particularly in the context of delays. So when bad weather hits, or other operational constraints arise, um, there can be an imbalance between capacity and demand. 
And because of that, there needs to be delays introduced to the system. So there are various um, initiatives that could be used, such as ground delay programs, where flights are held on the ground um, at their origin before taking off, um, miles and minutes in trails, um, which expands the required spacing um, between aircraft, and airspace flow programs, um, which meters demand um, through in route airspace. And these, air these initiatives um, are shown as low level controllers on the right, and they interact with the system. So there's a huge body of research related to this, um, including the ATFMP, or the Air Traffic Flow Management Problem, which is formulated as a large scale optimization problem. And before that, there's also the single or multi airport ground holding problem, which does not consider en route sector capacity. So where can we go from here? Um, with initiatives like the FAA SWIM program, data availability and data sharing capabilities are increasing. Um, and an ongoing challenge is incorporating this data into real or near real time um, health monitoring of the airspace system and incorporating those into control mechanisms. So the central question is how we can use um, real time metrics in air traffic management decisions. Uh, broadly. So the idea is that we want to use um, a more closed loop system where real or near, near real time metrics um, coming from the airspace system can inform decision making. Uh, one way we could do this is we could use a high level planner to input metrics um, coming from the system to help a lower level controller, such as a ground hauling problem. Um, incorporate more complex objectives. So to give more details to this, um, this is an exploded view of the system. Um, the basic diagram is on the left, but the exploded view is on the right and uh, on the right and center. So we have some low-level controller, which in this talk will be a multi-airport <clears throat> ground holding problem solver um, that takes control actions on the system. And the control actions specifically are rescheduling and delaying flights. And the system then feeds back updated capacities and feasible times um, into the low level controller. So now we suppose that we have additional real time metrics available. And at a high level, we may be able to see um, how delays are expected to evolve across uh, several airports throughout the day. And we may not like how these delays are set to evolve. So we may have other goals for the system. For example, uh, we might want to control airport delays directly. And what I mean by that is um, from a system management perspective, you may want to reduce delay at certain target airports in exchange for slight increases in delay at non-target airports. And there may be more complex objectives um, about, we, about how we want the delay distributions to look like. The issue though is that directly controlling delays is of course a difficult goal because the control actions that we have to work with are, are taken out of flight level, um, which in aggregate can form airport delay distributions, but it's not like we can magically um, force things to comply to certain distributions. Um, so what we want to do is use um, what we call the high level planner to develop some sort of plan for how we would like to like the delays to evolve. And then we want to incorporate this plan in the low level controller um, to gently nudge the system toward more desirable delay states and distribution. And this two step approach, um, starting with the high level planner and following with the low level controller is necessary because directly incorporating some real time metrics into the low level controller may be difficult because recall that the low level controller could be a large scale optimization problem specifically with the MAGIP. Um, so user preferences and complex objectives could be difficult to incorporate. And in the high level planner, um, we can perhaps think of a more zoomed out view of the system and not worry about individual flights, but just set overall goals on system behavior. And I'll give more details on the high, high level planner first, uh, uh, specifically on what it does. And so this work is based on a series of previous work, um, mostly led by Max and Karthik. And in their work, um, we're able to think about a network of airport delays in a compressed representation. 
So suppose that at each hour, we have what we call an airport delay distribution network, where we have the hourly delay at each airport in the system. And with several airports, um, we can consider aggregating this into uh, some aggregate metrics. And in this plot, the airport delays are projected onto two dimensions, um, the total delay and total variation. The total delay is self-explanatory, um, indicating how much delay is in the system. And total variation is a notion of how spread out the delays are in the system. So the equation shown here um, has x sub i and x sub j being hourly delays at airport i and j respectively. And we're taking the squared differences in hourly delay between pairs of airports with some weighted adjacency a. And this weighted adjacency can take into account uh, correlations using factors like distance between a pair of airports or flight connectivity, flight connectivity which is like the number of flights um, between a pair of airports. So total variation can provide an insight into how expected or unexpected a current delay distribution is. So if Boston and New York, which are very close together um, and, and have lots of flights between them, um, have very different delays, we'd have a high contribution to total variation because it'd be unexpected for them to behave significantly differently. Uh, but on the other hand, if Boston and Hawaii, which are on opposite ends of the US, um, have um, very different delays, um, that's not too unexpected because they are very far apart and have at most one flight between them per day. So it would have a low contribution to total variation. Uh, we can also think about where we, we would want to be on this 2D projected space. And in general, probably the happy place is to have a low total delay and a low total variation um, such that the delays are distributed across the network in an expected manner. So we can go one step further and partition this space into various states. And I'll walk through four examples of delay distributions um, corresponding to four, four of the different partitions. So in the first partition, um, we have an example of low total delay and low total variation, partition one on the left. And the figure on the right plots an example of actual hourly delay observation across American Airlines network um, for the top 30 busiest US airports. And the magnitude of the dots indicates the size of the delay so here we can see that there's not much delay at all, and things are spread out very evenly um, in an expected manner. So we have low total variation. For the, sec for the second partition, um, we have a higher delay state, but with a normal spatial variance. So we have high delay throughout the network um, as we have larger and more red markers at airports, but it's fairly evenly distributed throughout the network. And there's not any huge imbalances between pairs of airports where it would be unexpected. In the third partition, um, we could have a low total delay, but with an abnormally um, high spatial variance um, with certain airports having higher delay than others. So there are some airports in the Northeast of the United States in this diagram uh, here that are close together, but have somewhat different delay states, which would be unusual or unexpected um, given their proximity. And then finally, in this fourth partition, we have a high total delay, but also a high and abnormally high spatial variance. Um, particularly here um, at one airport, there's a much higher delay than any of the other airports. So we can also use this um, 2D space to think of the progression of airport delays throughout the day or throughout some time period. And we can also think of disruptions in this space. So in the beginning of the day, we can start off with a low total delay and low total variation state, uh, partition one. Um, but after some disruption, we can move into the second state, which has higher delays and total, higher total variation. And then eventually we can loop back around and, reco and recover back to the first state. Um, these are called delay trajectories and are covered um, in other previous work, um, but we want to use this as a jumping, jumping off point 
um, as a perspective to inspire the design of our higher level planner. So we have we can have some old delay trajectory, which is with um, the way that delays are expected to evolve given current real time metrics. And then we can use the high level planner <clears throat> to propose a new delay trajectory that meets some complex objectives. So for, the, for this talk, what you need to understand about the high level planner is that it zooms out and looks at the network in terms of airport delay distributions and metrics like total variation and total delay. And for each look ahead time step, it proposes a new plan for how these airport delay distributions should evolve. So for at each, each uh, future time step, it provides a target hourly um, airport delay um, across the network. So now we can return to our projected 2D space and we see the old trajectory, uh, which represents what is expected to evolve based on some uh, vanilla multi-airport ground holding problem. Um, and then we have a new reference plan that's generated by the high level planner. And the, this plan is plotted on this 2D space, um, but each point um, contains within or below each point is um, airport delay distributions that are desirable. And you can start off with an initial time step. Um, and then in the next time step, we have an expected delay distribution um, output um, that is shown in blue based on the old trajectory. But instead, the high level planner um, could propose a different delay distribution uh, shown here in red, um, which has more desirable properties. And similarly, in the second time step, the reference plan again has a different proposed state. So to make this a lot more explicit, we can consider an example application, um, which is redistributing delays between airports. And this is what the high level planner will focus on in this talk. The setup is that we might be unhappy with how airport delays are expected to evolve. And thus we may desire to redistribute um, delays away from target airports. And here note that we're only working with flight delays, no flight cancellations. Um, but the high level planner is working on a more zoomed out view of the system and can propose a reference plan that meets this objective of redistributing airport delays. The high level planner does not have detailed information like flight schedules and capacities um, because it's working with more network measures like total delay and total variation and uh, crucially the airport delay distributions. So this is why we need to link the high level planner and the low level controller. So now we'll move on to describing the low level controller. And uh, we use the multi-airport ground holding problem, or MEGA for short, as our low-level controller. And recall that the example that we're working with is the airport delay redistribution. So we're going to test three um, different MEGA formulations to tell the story. Uh, the baseline MEGA <clears throat> is the standard one that minimizes total delay cost. There's also a redistribution MEGA that tries to directly incorporate uh, airport delay redistribution preferences. And then finally, there's an augmented MEGAP, um, which incorporates a reference plan from the high-level planner. So we can now look at the constraints that exist in all three versions of the MEGAP. Um, we start with arrival and departure capacities at all the airports across time. And these capacities must be adhered to in all time steps. We also want to make sure that the assigned departure and arrival times for each flight um, is feasible with respect to their originally intended schedules. And finally, we want to adhere to the minimum travel times for each flight. Um, the, the three formulations um, primarily differ in their objective functions. So the first formulation is the baseline MEGAP. And in the baseline, we minimize total delay costs 
which can be broken up into airborne delay cost and ground delay cost, where airborne delay is more costly than ground delay. Um, the second formulation is the redistribution megap, or R megap for short, um, where we are still minimizing this total delay cost, but we also include a term for target airport delays. And recall that target airports are airports um, from which we want to redistribute delay away from. So airports where we want to reduce delay essentially. And to do so, we can add an additional penalty for any delay incurred at target airports. Um, they'll already be penalized in the total delay cost, but we're adding an extra penalty um, just for the target airports. And the constraints in the mega make sure that the delays we assign to target airports are indeed viable and feasible, um, such, such that the schedule is still viable and all the flights are meeting their um, um, minimum travel times and et cetera. Uh, the third formulation uh, will still minimize total delay cost, <clears throat> but it also penalizes deviation from the reference plan from the high level planner. And thus the resulting airport delay distributions will try to be as close to the reference plan as possible. So now we can move on to the results with an example scenario. We tested six different uh, disruption scenarios, um, but we'll show an American Airlines hub scenario today. So in each scenario, um, five airports experience some reduced capacity. And here we chose to reduce capacity at American's five busiest hubs um, shown on the left. And note that the makeup is being run on all the flights across all airlines. It just happens that this disruption scenario um, only affects the, the American Airlines hub airports. But of course, there's other airlines that fly at those airports. And then we need to decide on which airports will be the target airports to redistribute delay away from. So we first run a baseline makeup and pick the airports with the um, highest 15 minute delays and which end up being the airports in blue on the right, where we will try to redistribute delay away from. So some results, um, we now compare the behavior of the redistribution makeup, which is the R makeup, which tries to directly encode redistribution um, desires. Um, and, we, and we also look at the augmented MAGIP or a MAGIP, and both of these are looked at um, relative to the baseline. So the first thing to note is that both of these formulations result in a very similar total delay to the baseline MAGIP, which is good. Um, and specifically it's within like 0.02%. So the increase in delay is either zero or negligible. And next, starting with the R megap, um, we, see, we see it leads to a reduction in delays at target airports, specifically target airports, um, by 18.1% relative to the baseline solution. And the figure on the right um, shows hours on the x-axis and the delay change relative to the baseline megap on the y-axis. So a positive value means that there's more delay relative to the baseline. Um, while a negative value uh, means there's less delay relative to the baseline. And looking at the top right, as, as expected, um, the non-target airports generally get more delay relative to the baseline. Um, but there's also a severe um, spike in increase of delay um, at non-target airports. Um, on the other hand, the augmented uh, MAGIP or the A MAGIP leads to a delay reduction in target airports as well, um, but only by 13% um, compared to 18% with the R makeup. And so looking at the plot on the bottom right, we see that we have a smoother solution in the sense that the non-target airports um, in red are not as severely impacted um, with the A makeup as with the R makeup on the top right. So if you want like a maximum delay reduction, <clears throat> the R makeup seems like it would be preferable um, because it reduces delay at target airports more, but it comes at a high price of um, variability in the non-target airport delays, specifically these, uh, the red curve up here.
So th these maps uh, show the origin destination pairs of flights whose delay changed relative to the baseline. And this is for the A negative. And first note that 89% of flights had unchanged delay relative to the baseline negative. And this is really important <clears throat> because although we are redistributing airport delay, we want to avoid changing too many flight schedules. And the target airports are shown in blue again. And the more intense the red or more intense the color, um, the greater change in delay. And we can see on the left-hand side of these plots that the flights with the largest decreases in delay um, tend, to, tend to have an origin or destination at a target airport. So we, now we can bring back this notion of total variation, which recall is a measure of the geographic spread of delays in the network. And while the R makeup has a slightly less total variation than the baseline, um, the A makeup has significantly less total variation than the baseline. And this represents the fact that delays with the A makeup are more evenly distributed. Um, but in contrast, the R negative sometimes has total variation higher than the baseline. As we can see here, the red curve of the R negative can be above the baseline in blue, uh, meaning it leads to airport delay distributions that are unexpected or very spread out. Uh, for a final set of results, um, we consider a detail about the A MAGIF. So recall that the A MAGIF is tracking some reference plan. There's a parameter that we call theta that modulates um, how, how much you're penalizing um, deviation from the reference plan. And higher values of theta uh, mean that there's a higher penalty for the low level controller straying from the airport delay distributions proposed by the high level planner. And we want to see the impact of increasing theta. Sorry, five minutes, Chris. Yeah, thanks. So as it turns out, um, increasing theta to larger values, as expected, can increase total delay. And the issue here is that with higher levels of theta, um, the low level controller is heavily penalized for deviating from the high level planner. Um, but this creates a large burden on the low level controller for re reproducing as best as possible um, the airport delay distributions from the high level planner. And this comes at the cost of total delay, um, the other term in the A makeup objective, um, as there's more emphasis relatively on replicating these airport delay distributions in the reference plan and less on minimizing the total delay cost. So this plot shows total delay on the x-axis and total variation on the y-axis um, for different values of theta in the A-mega. And in this case, the optimal theta in terms of lowest total variation and lowest total delay is 0.7. Um, but that theta value is, um, of course, scenario and situation dependent. So some sort of analysis would need to be done to um, pick the right theta to make sure that you're not forcing the low level controller to comply um, too strongly with the high level planner. So I'll quickly finish up with some um, concluding thoughts and future work. So in summary, what we did is we developed a hierarchical framework with a low level controller, um, specifically a negative optimization and a high level planner. Um, our high level planner worked on redistributing network delay distributions. Um, and then the mega translated it into actual flight schedules. So the high level planner provides a reference plan, which consists of target airport delay distributions. Um, but then the low level controller has to then translate it into feasible, into feasible flight schedules because the high level planner is working on more abstract terms, not considering individual flights and capacities. Um, there's many directions this work could go. So the first is incorporating connecting flights and sector capacities in the low level mega. Um, connecting flights could have a drastic impact on which flights are chosen to be delayed because of propagation effects. And we could also think about adding flight cancellations as that is a way to 
potentially eliminate system delay. Um, and then finally, there could be some feedback loop or feedback mechanism between the high-level planner and the low-level controller. So consider the case um, where the low-level controller cannot implement the high-level planner's request. And we sort of saw this with the very high levels of theta, where if the low-level controller were to try to comply with the high-level planner um, too much, um, it would degrade performance. So in this case, the low-level controller could alert the high-level planner um, that it wasn't really able to find an adequate solution, and the high-level planner could come back and um, come, up, come back with a tailored or more updated reference plan. And going back to this full scale diagram, um, we have the low level controller here. Um, we have, it feeds in to the system. The system generates metrics that are put into the high level planner. And then where the feedback loop would be is the high level planner. Um, the, the work we showed goes from the high level planner informing the low level controller of some targets, but we could form this loop here where the low level controller gives some feedback to the high level planner. And this could be some iterative process. So thanks for listening to our talk. Um, I look forward to answering questions. And this first paper is our ATM paper. And then these next two papers um, are two other papers by Max, Karthik, and Hamsa that provide more details on the workings of the high-level planner. And uh, thank you, Jose. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, uh, 17 o'clock. So you, you are completely right with this. So we have 10 minutes for questions. Please feel free to send the questions through the question and answer session. Uh, we have already one uh, that is coming from, from Midori. Uh, it is dealing with the fact that the fairness of the delay distribution among airlines is something quite sensitive. And she is asking how you try to take this fairness inside your study now, or if you intend to take this in the future, because if I remember well, you say that uh, you have took five American Airlines uh, airports where they have impact. If you try to put more airports like the ones you have included there, they will be a probably very difficult to manage project uh, with uh, lots of airports, all of them with restrictions and, and the, the space of solutions could be quite narrow if existing. Yeah, thank you for the question, Midori. Um, I couldn't have planted a better question myself because we are, this is actually one of the things we're working on. Um, so one thing we're considering is um, if we're still sticking with the MAGA formulation, um, we could alternate who gets, alternate which airline gets control of the MAGA. Um, and then we could, each airline could have a um, maximum delay cap. So, um, when, it, when it's an airline's turn to run the MAGIP, um, they get some flight schedule information from the airlines, from the other airlines, but they can use their own private information to try to optimize the schedule to help themselves. Um, but there's a maximum amount that they can um, delay other airlines. And related to this work also is the idea of keeping a ledger or keeping track of um, how much delay the airlines have incurred relative to other airlines and making sure that um, this tries to stay balanced. So if there's a huge imbalance, then maybe the system could step in and either give control of the mega to another airline or um, in a centralized version, it could um, in the next round of scheduling um, force um, other airlines to help out airlines that have been severely um, penalized in past time steps. So yeah, I think this is an important question. Um, and it, we're still working on it, but um, I'm glad that uh, someone asked about this because it's um, it validates like why we're working on this and certainly a big issue of fairness. Or Suri, you feel uh, that uh, you could answer the question uh, in written through the question and absence panel, feel free. If you have more information, this will still be open. So you could answer the question uh, more in detail later on. Uh, one of the general, well, while we are waiting for additional questions to be put on the panel, uh, I have one is that uh, when reading your paper, 
something that uh, for this paper and for the previous one, for both of them, but in particular for yours, uh, I, I recommend everyone to read the paper because there's much more details on the paper than on the presentation, for sure. It's not possible to present a 10 pages paper fully inside a, a presentation like this. So it's a, enjoy the reading because it's really interesting to read the paper, but you have the impression that this is one of those things that is academically perfect is very, very interesting to read, but uh, we are not able to, to really measure the distance thing between this paper and the real world. Uh, do you have intentions to try to test this in the real world? Because the uncertainty that is one of the problems that is behind every corner of the paper uh, could be very difficult and could put a big challenge on the algorithms. Yeah, we don't have concrete plans to test it on live systems, um, but that is something that we would definitely potentially be interested in. Um, I think addressing this fairness issue would definitely help um, try to make move this research in the direction where it's more practically in, implementable. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that, um, that there right now there is some distance between um, the theory and the practice. Um, but that is something that we will work on addressing that gap. Okay, thank you very much. There are more questions from the audience. Some more things to be said. If I remember well, when I was reading the paper, uh, okay, I, I have seen uh, on the chat uh, an answer from, from uh, Hamza. Uh, telling that one good hope that theory leads practice, that's true. That's quite interesting, but uh, the, the theory should be checked in practice later on. And you have put the practice in, in, on the table, sorry, the theory on the table. So now we expect that you help uh, to try to put the, the, the practice about those things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and that's why I asked you, what, what's your future job on that? I hope I will see a future paper with this kind of thing. Okay, uh, some more uh, to be said. Some more questions. I have another one. What was the time horizon of your study? Did you run one day? Uh, you have those details on the paper itself that is very well documented, but please answer, Chris. Yeah, so exactly. We, we ran it for um, one day, has not um, And it was looking at the um flights in and out of the top 30 airports um in the US and the data was from um Bureau of Transportation Statistics BTS so that's where we got the um scheduled times and yeah the delay states would evolve over the course of one day yeah okay so you have your answer one day uh, we are keeping uh, in increasing practice we have two questions here and we have known in the previous one, so it's wonderful. Uh, with, you have already answered these two questions, and there is three more minutes. If you would like to give some more details on, on the paper, or, or if not, I will look for one of, of my own questions that I have here. Uh, one of the things that uh, we were discussing when reading the paper you write was the distance of some of the airports that you consider there and the uncertainty that is behind this distance because you could you should plan more than four hours in advance for this kind of things and uh, in a bad weather situation this kind of things for four hours in advance is really difficult to predict uh, how do you intend to do that to tackle this inside your your project yeah i think I think that's one of the benefits of a hierarchical framework is that you can, the high level planner can quickly on the fly um, implement these real time metrics and give updated um, reference plans to the low level controller. So if we were try to try to directly encode all these user preferences into the low level controller, um, we wouldn't be as agile and able to reacts to um, uncertainty, future uncertainty um, in capacity. But with the high-level planner, um, it can work a lot faster and give a just a simple reference plan that the um, low-level controller can follow. Okay. 
thank you very much. Uh, it's time to go nearly. So thank you for, for the presentation. If uh, you could give me back the, the control of the present. Ah, there is another question. Uh, you say uh, there is uh, Husni Hidris says, you prioritize airports with high delay. Do you think you should also prioritize airports with high flight connectivity for propagation effect? Yeah, that's a great point, Hosni. I think that's certainly a, a good future direction. Um, so one way to loosely encode that would also be incorporating the flight connections as I talked about. I guess that'd be like the very direct way. But yeah, what you mentioned here would also be good as prioritizing, prioritizing airports and with high flight connectivity or maybe even um, airports that are close together as well. Yeah, thank you very much. So time to go. Uh, this first session is finished.